This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. I just checked in with Charlie and I just thought I'd kick us off with, with a karakia. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not a prayer as such, um, but it's a way that we would ritually start things in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So here we go. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina kuta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi aki ana te akākura, e tio, e huka, e hauhunga, haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. And, and what that means uh, literally is get ready for the westerly, um, be prepared for the southerly. You know, that's the cold wind for us, remember? It will be icy cold inland and icy cold on the shore. May the dawn rise, red tipped on ice, on snow, on frost. Um, join, come together, unite. And so this ancient karakia was recited uh, to centre those that were hearing it, to focus their attention on the job at hand, to acknowledge place and to prepare for a journey. So hopefully that kind of care will last for a full 24 hours of journey and I will um, set off on our first part of it. So bear with me, I'm just gonna to switch to um, my presentation. That's a wonderful start, Dan, thank you. Couple of Yeah, we can see it. Great, voice of the river experimenting with commons in Aotearoa, New Zealand. As Charlie mentioned, he asked each of us to introduce ourselves. So I'm gonna do this in the traditional Māori way. Uh, ko waikato te awa, ko taupiri te maunga, ko waikato tainui te iwi, ko tainui me te arawa ngā waka, ko au, he uri o hotu roa, Ko tamate kapua, ko tia, ko dan hukuroa, toko ingoa. In a Māori worldview, we exist in a kinship-based relationship with the tai ao, the earth, the universe, and everything in it. This relationship is called whakapapa. Whakapapa is the central principle that orders the universe, that demonstrates an interconnectivity between everything, and is a cognitive genealogical framework connecting creation of the universe to everything that exists within it by descent from primal parents. The Whakapapa ontology lies at the very core of Māori thinking, knowledge, identity and practice. Within this framing, water is an ancient kin, a revered elder. Within this framing, waterways can be ancestors. In 2014, New Zealand recognised the Te Uruwera, a former national park comprising forests, waterways and lakes, as its own legal personality, stating, and I read from the, from the act here, Te Arawera is ancient and enduring, a fortress of nature alive with history. Its scenery is abundant with mystery, adventure and remote beauty. And I remind you all that that is law in New Zealand, that is poetic, that is beautiful. And then in 2017, New Zealand recognised Te Awatupua, as an indivisible and living whole, comprising the Whanganui River from the mountains to the sea, incorporating all its physical and metaphysical elements as its own legal personality. And once again, I read there verbatim from the Act. So we're including indivisible and living wholes, and we're including physical and metaphysical elements in our experiments and commons in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So these experiments are founded upon Māori philosophies and are enacted through a Westminster-based government system. They fundamentally shift thinking from an anthropocentric to a relational framing. As I said, in a Māori worldview, everything is connected by a kinship stemming from the primal parents, Ranginui Sky Father and Papa Tuanuku Earth Mother. This relationship is called Whakapapa. And in this worldview, we don't own anything. In fact, the notion of owning anything and one's mother, in the case of the land and the earth, is abhorrent. And so perhaps this might challenge some commons narratives, but I'll find ways that we can link in Māori worldviews with commons understandings. 
And in this presentation, I'll briefly discuss these experiments, um, their framing, and where resource, water, and ocean law aspirations are heading. But first, I'll give you some background to Māori ways of knowing. It was, and still is considered to be bad manners when meeting someone for the first time, to directly ask them who you are, or who are you, or indeed even their name, what's your name? Instead, of course, in the relational, relational schema, the usual question is, nor here, koi, where are you from? Perhaps the question that another one you may ask is, nor why, koi, from which waters are you? And then in my mind, perhaps the question that sits closest to the whakawhapa framing is, na why, koi, from whose waters are you? Now, the reasoning behind such an approach relates to the philosophy of that introduction that Pepeha gave it at the beginning. Identity stems from belonging. Ko o te awa, ko te awa, ko o. I am the river, and the river is me. Furthermore, it's also practical. The chances of someone knowing about your river, your lake, or your ocean, or where you're from, are much greater than them maybe knowing you as an individual. And it is also in keeping with humility, a trait much revered in Māoridom and in many societies and cultures worldwide. In contrast, by asking someone their name, you're assuming that you might know them. And furthermore, you're seeing them as an individual first and not part of that collective whole and not being respectful to their ancestors, those rivers, those mountains of which they are the living face. Now, the esteemed scholar, academic and intellectual, Dane Professor Anne Salmon, once bemoaned our approach to water management in New Zealand, stating that we should treat our rivers as taonga, not toilets. Now, taonga is a Māori word often translated into English as treasure or treasures. And while that translation is not incorrect, it does not fully encompass the complete meaning of the word, missing the relational component. The best understanding I have of Tama is the active, to be treasured. So typically in an interactive session, I would ask people um, what they might envisage to be a treasure. And typical answers I get are, oh, gold or silver or jewels or a treasure chest. Something tangible, something you can pick up and you can lock away. And then when I ask people, what do you treasure? I get very different answers usually. Family. Um, love, um, fellowship, um, the ability to go for a swim in, in the beach or in the ocean, in a river. And I believe that Anne was using the word taonga in that context, not meaning we should put water in a treasure chest and lock it away. Rather, we should treasure it as water, as an ancestor, and as an integral part of human life. So in New Zealand, Fresh water and rivers were an election issue, and we held our election uh, late last year. In fact, this time last year, we were just deciding our, our government. And it is collective efforts like this World Commons seminar series that keep the pressure on governments. There is an, an immense amount of work going on at Flax Roots, that's the New Zealand version of grassroots, at the Springs Roots even, but sadly, we don't think they are reaching the scale or rapidity of change that is needed. And I don't think it's enough to rely on government. But how do we find ourselves in a place where this river here, the Waikato, the very river that I identify with as my ancestor, this is taken at the beginning of its journey, flowing out of Lake Topo Nui Atea. How can a river wind up looking like this? before it flows into the ocean. Now, how do we find ourselves in a situation where this river here, formerly known as Te Awa or Te Atawa, literally the river of the gods, known today as the Tarawera, Tarawera River, looks like this up in its headwaters with forest right down to its edges and beautiful um, water full of, of life. And in its short 65 kilometre journey, it looks like this when it flows out into to Moana Atoi, the Bay of Plenty at the coast. Now these types of things have happened on our watch. It's happened even when we have legislation designed to protect our rivers and waterways. 
And while the tragic situation that has befallen both the Waikato and the Tarawera rivers is not unique, across New Zealand, many rivers are no longer safe for fishing and swimming. In Kiwis, New Zealanders are seriously concerned about declining river health. And those are the rivers and streams that haven't been subjected to the abject humiliation of having been buried alive in concrete or plastic pipes, or those that only flow sporadically, if at all, as their waters have been over alligated for irrigation or other purposes. Hundreds of kilometres of waterways have been buried alive, and the other waterways in New Zealand are in a perilous state. Data show an overwhelming trend of degraded water quality, of lost wetlands, of exhausted or polluted aquifers, and catchment land modification. Burying streams and rivers alive remains civil engineering best practice. And for many years, voices articulating their fears about the decline were ignored in favour of development imperatives. But more recently, communities, industry, business, politicians and philanthropists have joined the chorus of concern. Some sobering statistics. And we can see these terrible, terrible things that are happening. And so there is debate around whether it is the acts or the, the laws themselves or the implementation or the enforcement of the laws that has led to this. But what we know for sure is that it creates a space where decision makers will argue about a, a parts per million trend this and a dissolved oxygen percentage that. Missing the point entirely that in whatever techno-scientific terms and rationalizations have been used to make those decisions, the rivers are dying. You know, rare retrospective daylighting projects are being paraded as gold standard, but in reality over 99% of actual practice continues with varying streams. Many of our authorities argue they are doing things by the book. Well, maybe they are, and maybe they aren't. But if they are, then maybe the book's wrong. In fact, the book must be wrong because the data, as we can see here, prove it. And so the dominance of anthropocentrically framed, bottom line, humans first, regulatory approach of the government's um, freshwater laws, we argue, is flawed. Sadly, yeah, yeah, Mr. Charlie, sorry to interrupt you. But we have a, a phone-in call listener, and I'm wondering if you want to read the stats on your slides since they can't see that. Perfect. Okay, Charlie, good point. So it says 70% of our rivers don't meet swimming standards. Half of our lakes are polluted with excess nutrients and or overrun by invasive pests. Sediment chokes most harbours and estuaries. 90% of our wetlands are gone. And wetlands are, of course, the kidneys of the Earth's system. And 18 to 34,000, 18,000 to 34,000 people contract waterborne diseases every year in New Zealand. Thanks, Charlie. Sadly, though, New Zealand is not alone. The truth is that dominant civilizations on the planet are behaving in a way that is leading our children and our children's children and our children's children's children into a bleak, unsustainable future that most of us don't want. The laws and governance systems allowing this justify their acts based upon Judeo-Christian Judeo ideals of dominion over all things, you know, a Cartesian dualism of a nature and culture split, and entrench the illusion of separation and independence. And I quote now Thomas Berry um, in a forward to Cormac Cullinan's Wild Law. This mechanistic view of the world as controlled by humans for human advantage sees the world as a vast assembly of natural resources put there for human use. With the vast extent of our knowledge and technology and the power of our, sorry, and the power of our technologies came an arrogant assurance that we could manage any difficulty associated with our actions. It's just hard to believe that in a few short centuries, our species has been able to reach such wanton destruction and havoc. We're still, Many are now bored of or dulled by the increasingly frequent news of environmental destruction, of climate change and its impacts 
and impending ecological disasters. The details of what we're doing to Earth and how harmful our impacts are are complex and some of the facts controversial or maybe even worse, just being ignored. However, it is obvious that we are behaving in a manner which is destroying our world. A quick reminder of how we find ourselves in this situation in the first place. Nicholas Stern talks about climate change being evidence of market failure. We also have the theory of moral sentiments, the 1759 book by Adam Smith. Now it provided the ethical, philosophical, psychological, and methodological underpinnings to Smith's later works, including the often cited and referred to wealth of nations. So to recap here, reliance on legislation such as in New Zealand, the Resource Management Act, has failed to protect waterways. An assertion that the market would drive positive change was at best misguided, and faith that technology would provide solutions has yet to deliver. The laws, the drivers and rationales of decision makers are based upon flawed understandings, whereby humans are independent from nature. Such a framing led to a situation whereby many of our rivers are dying. And it appears at a first glance as if people just don't care. However, in the last decade, New Zealand has been on a journey of change. One example of that is the National Policy Statement on Freshwater Management. Don't try and get into the detail here. I didn't put the text so small to try and, um, to try and break your eyes. I'll pull out the salient points. It says that fresh water is essential to well-being. And it says, look, it gives income generators competitive advantage in the global economy, highly valued for recreational value. Water has a deep cultural meaning to all New Zealanders, including Maori, of course. And it acknowledges in the New Zealand context, the Treaty of Waitangi as the underlying foundation of Crown, government and Maori relationships. And within this national policy statement on freshwater management, there is a section called Te Mana o Te Wai. Te Mana o Te Wai, uh, I'll give it a translation, but recognising that trying to translate words into other languages always has difficulties, but uh, the authority, prestige, charisma, or mana, of the water. So Te Mana o Te Wai is the integrated and holistic well-being of a freshwater body. Upholding Te Mana o Te Wai acknowledges and protects the Māori or its life-supporting capacity. This requires that in using water, you must provide for the health of the water body, the health of the environment, and the health of the people. In other words, it first emphasises the right of a river to be a river. And second, the need to ensure the integrity of the catchment and biota. And only then can people seek to derive sustenance. This section incorporates the values of Māori and the wider community in relation to each water body. And what it's intended to do is to help community, including Māori, and the consenting authorities uh, to develop tailored responses to freshwater management that work within their region, noting that is first it is the right of a river to be a river. Yeah, we'll go to the next part. And so although it is never explicitly stated, the underlying assumption is that we have a form of ownership rights of water in this in contrast, a Māori and indeed an indigenous worldview sees humans as belonging to Papatūnuku, belonging to Mother Earth, not the other way around. So although the recognition of Te Mana o Te Wai in this national policy statement, incorporating a Māori approach and privileging, privileging the use of Māori knowledge is a significant step forward the policy statement is still a legislative instrument founded upon 19th century ideas 
about property rights, which in turn are derived from acceptance of Cartesian dualism, trying to reconcile two worldviews with no advice or guidance on how to negotiate the dichotomy and the significant power imbalances therein. In March 2017, the Whanganui River on the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand was granted the status of legal personhood. A new legal entity was created, Te Awatupua, referring to an indivisible and living whole from the mountains to the sea, incorporating the Whanganui River and all of its physical and metaphysical elements, as I mentioned earlier. This law conferred Te Awatupua all the rights, powers, duties and liabilities of a legal person. Although the idea of treating a river as a legal person is novel in Aotearoa, New Zealand, it joins an international chorus of legal and constitutional developments that assert the rights of nature, including initiatives in Bolivia and Ecuador, and following this act in India. And so Māori relational thinking might be understood to appreciate rivers as complex and emergent networks of plants, animals, land, water, and people in the dynamic process of co-evolution. As the new legal entity Te Awa Tupua describes, these living systems are fashioned by the co-evolution and interdependence of, woven, of interwoven biotic, abiotic, and social dimensions. For Māori, an awa is not just a river, but an interconnected living being that cannot simply be understood as a collection of measurable or definable parts. And noting that following the passing of this act, uh, the River Ganges was afforded legal personhood with a lot of the text mirroring uh, the, the New Zealand Act. Uh, and I don't think anyone in New Zealand was upset that they, they took the same wording. If that river is just as important to the people in India as the Whanganui River is to the people in New Zealand, then Katie Pai, that's all good. So, I am part of a research team, and our project is intent on growing a national movement of New Zealanders taking care of their waterways with the goal of reaching. 1,000 rivers in a state of aura, a Māori word meaning uh, holistic health, by 2050. Tawaroa seeks to transform New Zealanders' relationships with rivers, or maybe reform in the case of some people, founded upon the whakapapa relationship and building on practical and personal connections to foster a duty of care. Although a kinship approach is drawn from a Māori worldview and knowledge base, the idea enjoys widespread support of many Kiwis, as it is consistent with how many of them actually feel. Within this framework, Te Awaroa is using participatory and action research approaches, along with um, mana whenua monitoring, or mana whenua meaning uh, people with authority in that place, to allow the emergence of old and novel innovative approaches and tools to establish healthy relationships between the waterway and its people, animals and plants to bring about a very different way of living and being with rivers. The perception of apathy I mentioned earlier is really just that, a perception. In reality, dozens if not hundreds of committed, passionate and dedicated individuals and groups are working tirelessly around Aotearoa, New Zealand and dare I say around the world to achieve better outcomes for our rivers and waterways. Now, when I was hosted by the Coast Salish First Nations people in Vancouver, I learned that because we have two ears and one mouth, it is twice as important to listen as to speak. Therefore, a critical difference of this Te Awaroa effort is to reframe the issue from the perspective of the river. What would the river say? What is the river saying? We seek to articulate and then empower the voice of the river, drawing from all knowledge available. This is our vision. So in trying to articulate the voice of the river, our method is to view it through three lenses, river health, river behavior, 
and the river stories. River health is where we, we seek to draw in all that techno-scientific information, which we don't dismiss. It's very important, but it's not the only part of the river story. Things about minimum flows, the, how many nutrients, how much sediment, how many pathogens. We're looking at the health of the flora and the fauna in the river and on its banks. We then consider river behaviour that's in part governed by the geology. Will the rivers be um, confined in, in narrow valleys or will they be free flowing? Will they have waterfalls? We also consider the natural variation of a river. Rivers like, through time, to shift back and forth and flooding. Floodplains have become quite desirable places for agriculture for a long time because of their flat nature and their periodic refreshing of nutrient-rich sediments. It was when we started placing other infrastructure on those floodplains that we started getting upset when a river flooded. Now, it's called a floodplain for a reason. And when a river floods, that is just a river being a river. So maybe the river has been telling us all along, maybe we shouldn't be building here. And finally, the river stories. And this is where we try and bring in the human element. How do we know the river? Now, it's quite difficult in many parts of urban settings. And in fact, one of our case studies is trying to daylight a stream that's been buried for 50 years. And by daylight, I mean dig it out of the concrete pipe that it's buried underground and reinstate the river, reinstate the stream. And we also accept that there will be multiple views and stories. And no one has dominance over anyone else. We want to effectively tell a river ethnography. And of course we've been inspired by Māori knowledge. And I thought I'd just talk a little bit as we, as we draw toward the end of the seminar around what Mātauranga Māori, Māori knowledge is. And so Mātauranga is, is a continuum of distinct knowledge with Polynesian origins that grew in Aotearoa, New Zealand, inclusive of worldview, inclusive of values of culture and cultural practice and perspectives that established Māori identity, responsibilities and rights to manage and use resources. Mātauranga Māori was a Māori way of explaining the world. And it's understood within a Māori worldview, te ao Māori, that has at its foundation relationships between everything seen and unseen, humans and more than humans, the natural and the spiritual world, and in turn shapes the Māori way of doing things. Now previously ignored or disregarded by the science community because it seemed to be myth and legend, uh, fantastic and implausible, Matarama Māori does include knowledge generated using techniques consistent with the scientific method, but of course explained according to a Māori worldview. And one of those aspects of Matarama Māori, whoopsie, what's happened there, is kaitiakitanga. Kaitiakitanga is both a principle, a process, and a practice. And it's the application of knowledge-based, adaptive, collective decision-making, tailored to local, local conditions, and as observations of natural fluctuations in climate and human impacts upon ecosystems were made and experienced, the knowledge base has grown and practices were adapted and tailored. Another critical underlying component of kaitiakitanga is that change is the only constant, so that the resulting knowledge systems arose from them, both anticipated and accepted change as part of a natural process. So as I mentioned earlier, kaitiakitanga is a principle, a process and a practice, and considers the commons within a Māori worldview. So when we don't get stuff right, things like this happen. The stream that's buried that we're looking to daylight, if that had been reinstated, this would not have led to the flooding of the Urupa, the burial ground of the local people of 
Auckland, Ngā Te Whātua o Rākei. And so where might a Māori-inspired view incorporating commons ideas take us with respect to resource law? Well, how about a Tāunga Relationships Act? Tāunga, things that we treasure. Relationships, a Māori way of how we managed everything and understood everything. And therefore, you know, this would be grounded in a Māori worldview. And decisions were made regarding Papa Tūnapu, Earth Mother, and her offspring, Me Tōna Uri. So everything we look to do and make decisions of would be based upon the things we treasure and the strength of our relationships to them. And then, inspired by Te Awatupua, where we gave legal voice personality to a river and its catchment, and indivisible whole, the metaphysical and the physical components, we're now starting to turn our attention to what's often called the Pacific Ocean, but was known for centuries as Te Moana Nui Akiwa. In fact, that was just the name for it. The personification of it is Hine Moana. Now, in the open oceans, there's this concept of Māori nullius. Although it's not explicitly stated, it sits behind the justification of the United Nations Conventions and the Law of the Sea, which is beyond the limits of national jurisdiction, um, as well as its resources are the common, the common heritage of mankind. It may have been updated to humankind, I'm not sure. But Māori nullius means ocean, empty ocean, ocean without owner, ocean without people and it's the maritime equivalent to Tiranalias. Now we know that argument's been squashed already for Tiranalias. So we're looking to now explore what Māori Nullius might be and question its legal basis. So what if Hine Moana became your own legal personality? Hine Moana is a reality for Pacific Polynesian people. Hine Moana is known throughout Polynesia. We have a legal precedent, and Hine Moana will be the perfect candidate for international recognition. Are there challenges still trying to try and achieve this? Of course. But if we, if we never dare to dream, we'll never change what is. And so in conclusion, I'll just try to pull out a few commons ideas that are taking place in Aotearoa, New Zealand. You know, we, we frame it from a Māori worldview, and we're looking to do that more and more. A Māori worldview also says that any assertion of rights triggers responsibilities. And so therefore, if we consider commons and things to be common and common ownership to everyone, the ability to use that is assuming a right and in a Māori framing, a DRSA and Indigenous framing, that triggers responsibilities. And I think that might begin to turn around some of the challenges that Lord Stern and even Adam Smith, um, well, that Lord Stern warned us about and that Adam Smith encouraged us to use as lenses to look at wealth of nations. Because we are all Indigenous to this planet. And I said we need to start behaving that way. And I'm just going to leave um, the final slide with a quote from Herman Daly. And to paraphrase, the economy is a subset of the environment. And I think that could be where we need to start reframing our commons discussions. So, Noreira, Tinakoto, Tinakoto. I thank you for your attention and now I'll just click out of your presentation so that we can um, have some Q&A. So, so Dan, this is Charlie. Uh, given the people listening can't uh, have sound, I'm going to clap for all of them. <laughs> thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm, fo folks, um, attendees that are listening, I'm going to um, describe the question and answer in a minute, but I just want to say, Dan, um, and some people joined in after we started, this is the first of 24 webinars um, put on by the International Association for the Study of the Commons, and Dan, I can't think of a better one to start with. 
um, for a variety of reasons. One reason is you're, you're talking about both the local and go all the way up to the global, and the messages need to be global. Um, and I'm just, we're all so appreciative that you, you, you took the time to give this talk and it'll be recorded and stored. Um, but I'm not gonna take any more time saying what I think. Um, in the time we have left, we have to end at quarter of the hour so we can start another webinar. Um, attendees, if you have questions um, to ask uh, Dan, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen I'm looking at that, uh, that Q&A, and you're welcome to type in your questions, and I'll read them to Dan so he can answer them. While the questions might be coming in, Charlie, yeah. um, is, there, is there an opportunity for like an email or, or some other exchange kind of afterwards? I'm perfectly happy to fulfill questions from folks. That's, that's a wonderful idea. Um, uh, I'm going to open up the chat, which I think all attendees can um, uh, can read, um, and I think you can do this as well, Dan. So maybe you could put your email address in the chat. And um, while you're doing that, there's a question one attendee has asked, I am interested to know whether you think there are drawbacks to international law as a potential protective mechanism. I'm interested to know whether you think there are drawbacks to international law as a potential protective mechanism. Well, the answer is yes. I think there are drawbacks, but there are also advantages. Uh, if, if we have a look at um, some of the truly international uh, laws, and I'll, and I'll refer to those out of the UN, such as the Convention on the Law of the Sea, you know, some would argue that it's had uh, an impact. Others would say that it's been with, without teeth. I'll now refer to another UN, um, it's not really international law, a, a, a declaration of the rights of indigenous people where uh, sadly my country was one of the four that, that didn't sign it when it first came on they have since signed it and you know 10 years on since that has been ratified you could argue that there's been some benefits somewhere uh, but that it has not realized the intent I think that was behind it so it's, I'm kind of on the fence. So I think, yes, we need to have something because something's better than nothing, uh, but I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket. Kilda. So, uh, questioner, do you have any follow-up question? And others on the call, uh, feel free to ask questions if you have them. There, um, an another question, Dan, is can you, uh, um, oh, wait, well, let me go with this one because I think it's on the same thread possibly. The, uh, it could perhaps not, but um, so the concept of the quote, quadruple bottom line, uh, economic, social, environmental, and cultural has been discussed by New Zealand academics. Does this concept apply to rivers and intersection between economy and the environment? Do you want me to repeat that? No, no I've, I've got it. The answer was, it was supposed to, uh, and that law that you, you refer to and I refer to as the Resource Management Act in 1991, uh, at the time it was revolutionary in its intent. You could argue, and in fact, the, the author of that, that law, and uh, we had a change of government after it got written, and, and then the next person who came in who passed it, are both now of the, the opinion that it's, it hasn't delivered what it was supposed to deliver. What actually happened was economics took all the waiting and because when it came to the crunch was in the court systems where you had to apply to do an activity, say dump some waste into the river and you had to apply for a consent and you're supposed to apply and, and give basis for economic, social, environmental and cultural indicators. For the most part, it was always economic. It was just a cost benefit analysis. Then they started getting some environmental impact reports. And then when Māori started kind of getting a bit more voice, cultural impact assessments, I have yet to see a meaningful social impact assessment in any consent that I've looked at. So the Tama Relationships Act idea that I mooted would be something that uh, would replace, in my mind, the Resource Management Act. 
And I should also indicate that our Minister for the Environment noted on Monday that they will be revising the Resource Management Act. And I should also note for, the, for attendees that we also have a Zero Carbon Act that is going through, uh, sorry, bill that's going through discussions um, and the draft bill should be available soon for comment. There was a national conference of that on Tuesday uh, and I can maybe direct people's attention to some of the outcomes of that. Well, wonderful. Um, un unfortunately, uh, again, a few people joined late. Uh, oh, wait. So uh, the, the previous uh, questioner just said thank you for the informative answer. Um, uh, and I'm going to go with one more, and then we're going to have to stop the, the webinar because we have to start the next one in uh, less than 15 minutes. So um, the last question is does river quote personhood preclude industrial development? Does river personhood preclude industrial development? This hasn't been tested yet. The law being so new, uh, 2017. In my mind, I would like to think it wouldn't, but I think in practice, um, that won't preclude industrial processes. So, so with that, uh, I, I want to thank Dan again for taking the time and, and sharing his uh, really uh, fantastic um, ideas and research. Uh, I wanted to ask the question about what your hopes are from the uh, the research you're 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 um, working on now and how that might inform. Um, uh, that's probably a longer answer than we have time for, but I hope um, both you and the attendees will consider two things. One is um, the International Association for the Study of the Commons is holding a first virtual conference in mid-November. Um, that's coming up pretty quick. But then I also wanted it, everyone to know that in July 2019, the International Association of the Commons is holding its biannual annual uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru. And the deadline for paper abstracts for that has now been pushed, um, extended to uh, November 15, 2018, I believe. And that's just paper uh, abstracts. Um, and, and then lastly, uh, Dan, I think you've started this off in such a terrific way. Um, my sense is that the World Commons Week event has gone well enough I think it's gone terrific, frankly, um, that I, my hope is that we will do this every year um, and that we may start to do this, we'll do this again next October, and this is just the start. And I think the ideas such as yours that you're uh, uh, spreading, um, given this is a global research and practice association, it's the, it feels to me the right place to be trying to continue to expand your ideas. So. I hope, Dan, you'll consider um, that next year and, and also consider uh, Lima if you can. And the same is true for the attendees that are on the call. Um, so with that, I think I'm gonna close the session. Uh, if anyone on the call um, knows of people that would like to hear Dan's ideas, we are going to post, this has been recorded, and this will be posted sometime in the next week on the World Commons Week website so you, others can Spread the news. It's not. It's not stopping now. It'll be out there for other people to listen. So thanks again, again, Dan. I'm going to clap for the audience <laughs> and, and our, our gratitude for taking the time to do this. And thanks all the attendees for uh, for joining us today. If you've got nothing to do for the rest of the next 23 hours, just go down the list and keep joining. <laughs> thanks again, everyone. We'll be on teach now, but I'll certainly chime in later on. Thanks, Wonderful. Charlie. Thanks for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Love you all that.